Greetings and salutations. Welcome to Knife Chats with Tobias. What I'm going to be talking about today looks kind of boring. It is a bayonet. It's one of those spike bayonets. Particular one here is the uh, number four Mark II Star spike bayonet or socket bayonet used with the uh, British rifle number four Mark I, which was the uh, primary issue rifle for the British Army during World War II. Uh, by British Army, I also refer to most of the Commonwealth. Uh, and this is the bayonet that came with it. This is probably the second most produced of those bayonets. I will go over all that as well. But before I do that, I want to revisit this bayonet for a few minutes. Now this is the uh, Pattern 1907 bayonet. And uh, this was the uh, bayonet that the British Army used throughout World War I. It, went, it actually entered into service in 1907. It was... Uh, going to be replaced uh, just before World War I, but the war happened before they got around to replacing it. So it continued to service on throughout World War I and was still in service uh, at the beginning of World War II throughout most of the British Army and the Commonwealth. And it remained in service uh, primarily with the Australian and Indian Army throughout World War II. Um, New Zealand forces were also using this bayonet during World War II. Now, that is not to say that this bayonet did not make it into the Anzac forces or into the Indian Army during World War II. Um, because, quite frankly, quite a few Indian forces, as well as the um, uh, New Zealand forces especially, ended up getting um, the number four rifle as well as the older Mark III number one rifle. This is going to, or, I'm sorry, number one Mark III rifle. That was the original um, adopted short magazine Lee Enfield rifle, the, the number one Mark III. Uh, for simplicity's sake, we'll just call that one the Mark III. This bayonet went with that. The other rifle was the rifle number four Mark I. Uh, it received this bayonet, and uh, for simplicity's sake, it will just be referred to as the number four rifle. And this is actually the number four bayonet versus this one, which was the 1907 bayonet. So now why am I bringing all that up? Well, partly because I was under the impression that the Australian Army uh, was not using this during the war, but obviously, uh, that was a mistake. They did actually use this when they were uh, when they received uh, the number four rifle through British stocks. No doubt, I started confusing myself. Obviously, any Commonwealth force might have ended up with the number four rifle and the number four bayonet. However, Australia and India never adopted the number four rifle, sticking with the Mark III rifles, which they were making. Uh, in their own countries and using the 1907 pattern bayonet throughout the war. Besides the United Kingdom, the principal users of the number four rifle and number four bayonet were New Zealand and Canada. Several other smaller Commonwealth forces also adopted the number four rifle unless they already had existing stocks of Mark III rifles uh, in country. A lot of the number four service rifles were actually made in Canada as well as uh, in the infill factory in, uh, in uh, Great Britain. But the number four rifles were not made in Australia. They continued to make the Mark III rifle, and that was the rifle that was their issue rifle. And the same thing goes with the uh, Indian Army, which continued to make a licensed copy of the Mark III rifle as opposed to the number four rifle. Uh, and this bayonet, will only go on the Mark III rifle. This bayonet is made specifically for the number four rifle. So um, you would see a mix of these uh, during World War II, uh, but if it was a, um, but most likely would, uh, after 1943 or so, and these were definitely phased out of the British Army and the soldiers were receiving this uh, bayonet because this would not go on the number four rifle. 
Now, a couple other things about this bayonet that um, a few people have asked about and someone had commented. Uh, one of them was that uh, if it does not have the uh, arrowhead on there, then it was never accepted into service. This one actually has two arrowheads on uh, stamped on there, according to what uh, Slick Slicers of, uh, you know, Eric of Slick Slicer fame. He pointed out the reason they have this second arrowhead stamped in there is because that was it being taken out of service. And this particular one does have all the other markings on there uh, showing that it was entered into service. And this bayonet was actually made by uh, Wilkinson, the, the Wilkinson company, the people who made swords as well as razor blades later. Um, when it was made, sometime, um, most likely for World War I, uh, the pattern is 1907. That is the year it was introduced. All of the bayonets are stamped 1907. Um, this is a replica frog. I mentioned that in the other video. And uh, a, a person uh, uh, mentioned to me that almost every frog out there that you'll run into is a replica because the frogs just basically fell apart. You can imagine leather and mud in the uh, trenches of World War II. And this is a light horse cavalry version of the uh, leather frog that was used by the uh, British Army and also the Australian forces. So that's what it is. Um, uh, enough about this bayonet. <laughs> Let's move on to what the actual focus of this is, which is the number four bayonet. Okay, so what we have here is a bayonet that was never really liked by the British Army. Um, you can imagine why. It's a socket bayonet. It's also referred to as a spike bayonet, but I think officially it was a socket bayonet. And what it makes it a socket bayonet is it does not have a handle. It just has a socket that attaches to the barrel of the knife. Now, uh, as early as World War I, um, the British Army was already saying, our bayonets are too long, we need to shorten them. Uh, this, yes, this was uh, something that was useful. It, it could definitely get through the great coats and everything else, but it was also unwieldy, especially on the end of a long rifle when you're fighting in the trenches. So people think uh, this would be great for clearing out a trench, but not really the case. You really needed something shorter uh, the Germans already had switched to a 10-inch bayonet by the end of the war. Uh, the, the British were also looking at shortening their bayonets as early as the end of the war. Um, this bayonet is only 8 inches long, um, which is a little short um, compared to many of the other bayonets coming out at the beginning of World War II. Uh, primarily the German bayonet at the beginning of World War II was still 10 inches. What's more, the uh, German bayonet actually had a real blade. Uh, but for some reason, the British Army decided, let's go back to just a spike. What we need is just something to poke people with. And the original spike um, actually was milled out. This actually began life as the uh, number four Mark I bayonet. And in that bayonet, the, uh, the spike as well as the socket portion was all machined from the same piece of steel. And what they had done is they had milled out portions of the spike going all the way up to the length of the top. Notice how the top is here. It's just flattened on both sides. But originally it was milled out into a cruciform shape. So it was basically making a cross with four edges. None of the edges were sharpened and it was just so to increase penetration. Um, and like I said, it was milled from one solid piece of steel and then they just uh, put in the, uh, the little latch to lock it onto the barrel. And notice how it is cut so that it can hook into some lug nuts or lugs on the end of the barrel uh, of the uh, number four rifle. And it actually was flush with the very front of the barrel. The barrel barely fit through there. So you had eight inches of penetration using the spike. Um, and these original bayonets, uh, the, the, the cruciform shaped Mark IV number one bayonet, um, was primarily, was only made by, uh, Singer Sewing Machine Company in Scotland. 
Uh, they made 75,000 of them. And at that point, uh, well, things really started tensing up and uh, 1940 rolled around and this thing called World War II started. And it was quickly determined that we need a lot more bayonets and we need them a lot more faster and how can we do this and, and how can we speed up production time and everything else. And the first thing they decided was, do we really need to cut all those you know, lines into this bayonet to make it into a cross? And it was like, no, we don't. Uh, a nice round tube is going to poke just as well as that cruciform shape and that's why what they did was they just ended up flattening out both sides and making it a point and it's not extremely pointy as you can tell you can even look at it there it's not extremely pointy but it does poke and you put a little force behind it and it will definitely penetrate the body which is really what they wanted the bayonet to be able to do very lightweight it's um I think it's nine ounces it'll be in the specs at the end uh, and so they got rid of the uh, milling to get the cruciform shape left it with a round tube and entered the uh, number four mark two bayonet and uh, over three million of those were made and uh, this is not a number four mark two this is actually a number four mark two star now, someone out there will probably correct me on this, but I believe what that means is this is the uh, uh, an acceptable substitute for the number four Mark II bayonet. Now, the difference between the number four Mark II and the number four Mark II star is this little bump you see right here. You see how they, they've got a nice little groove going all the way around there? And that is because what they did was they decided, well, we can machine this out of one hunk of steel and then we can just have almost anyone make the spike here. Uh, very easy to do. It's just a, a metal spike and then you flatten out the ends. And then what we can do is join those together later. That's going to save us a lot of machining time and everything else. And it'll also cut down on the amount of steel that is being used to produce these things. And that's what they started doing. They started making... A, a basically an accepted sub substitute for the standard which was the Mark II and um, really basically what you had is this big chunk up here being made and then a spike being in, inserted into there welded in place and you have the Mark II star so this was actually the third version of the bayonet to be made and they were making these I believe as early as 1941-1942 um, this particular one is made by a company called Prince Smith and Stales. Um, and I know that because I can actually read the, uh, the markings on the side here. And on the, on the markings here, I can also see the Mark II star. Now, someone has intentionally tried to file away most of that stuff, but you can still see the little arrowhead there where it was accepted for service. So this is a, an actual issued bayonet for World War II for the uh, number four rifle. Um, like I mentioned before, they were not popular, but they did have a use and they did work. Uh, the, the main problem that the soldiers did not like about it was you would think because, well, what can you do with it? It's, do you really want to fight with something like this well, it was not a fighting knife. It was something that was used for um, you know, sticking people by sticking it on the end of your rifle, something that isn't done a lot. Um, but a blade would have been nicer because then even if it was like this, you could at least use it to cut things. You know, not necessarily fighting, but you could have at least used it for cutting things. Now, at the same time, you know, uh, the British soldier was not just issued this bayonet, he was also issued uh, a clasp knife or a pocket knife, whatever way you want to call it. Uh, and there were basically two main options out there. It was a two-piece clasp knife and a three-piece clasp knife. These are usually referred to as a British Army knife, uh, two-piece British Army knife, three-piece British Army knife. Now, uh, the two-piece uh, knife is the same, basically, as the three-piece knife. The only difference is, is the three-piece knife also has a marlin spike on it. Um, some people think that this was the army knife 
this is the navy knife uh that is not the case uh, thank you slick slicers he pointed that out to me a while back these were actually issued to the army the british navy had a different knife the royal navy navy had a different knife um, a little bit larger than this and the uh, navy knife lacks a can opener now if you notice this is just the can opener there's no cap lifter on it uh, i do not know if uh, cap lifters showed up after the war or not i just do not have enough of these knives and have not looked at enough examples to know if the cap lifter was showing up on this blade yet or not uh, this is a 1943 version of the knife um, it does have its acceptance stamps on there and everything else this is the type of cap lifter on it you got bakelite handles on there and a, um, a steel uh, clevis on the back here now as you saw already it also has a marlin spike and then the final blade on it is a sheep foot blade which makes you think that this is something that would be used for the Navy, but it was basically the primary utility knife issued to the British Army during World War II, a knife very similar to this. Well, this is an actual issue knife for World War II. Um, the other thing you have on the top here is a little uh, pry, but it's principally a flathead screwdriver. Uh, most screws at the time were just flathead screws. Uh, and quite frankly, they continue to use it. Uh, flathead screws and a lot of um, um, things in the military simply because you can use anything to turn them. Like I mentioned, this was the earlier one. This is a 1941 version. Still has the Bakelite handles and you have a copper clevis on there. And it also has the, uh, the acceptance mark right there, if you can see it. Um, I'll have it in the slideshow at the end though. So those are the two and three bladed uh, or two piece and three piece clasp knives issued to the British Army during World War II alongside of the bayonet. So really their cutting needs were met, but what they lacked was a fighting knife and most other uh, armies had an actual bladed uh, bayonet with a handle on it that could double as a fighting knife. Uh, the British did not and so this is one of the reasons why this was unpopular. But it did have one really cool feature or they actually did adopt this for or adapt this for another purpose which I'll get into in just a little bit but before I go there let me talk about the uh, the other things that go with this. The uh, the frog and the scabbard that uh, meet up with it. And so here we have one version of the uh, frog and the uh, scabbard here. And you know what, I'm going to take a moment and take this apart. Okay, here's the bayonet and the scabbard. Notice the big button up here. And here is the frog for the bayonet. This is the uh, pattern 37 frog. Now what the what the 37 refers to is the 37 webbing, the 1937 uh, web gear that was adopted for the uh, British Army. Uh, this is in a khaki color or a mustard color. Uh, later on, they would make it in a green color, uh, but this was the initial color that came out, um, and it is uh, just a heavy webbing. See on the back there, GEW, uh, 1943, that is when it was made. And then it's got a stamp up here uh, of, with the number four on it. Now, this uh, frog does not fit this bayonet very well, if you can tell. It's not going to fall through, but if you take the bayonet out, this slides all the way down into there. And it could work its all the way out. So why would this frog be so big, considering how skinny the uh, scabbard is and why do you need this extra loop of material up here considering the bayonet doesn't have a handle well if you remember our old friend the 1907 bayonet was still in service also so this uh frog was also large enough to fit the 1907 bayonet 
And that is also why you see the gap here, which is where the stud for the 1907 bayonet would come through, and then the buttonhole here, which is used for the uh, number four bayonet. And this loop up here is actually to catch the handle of the pattern 1907 bayonet. Later on, the British would also come out with another bayonet, which was the uh, number five bayonet. I believe it might have been a number five Mark I bayonet as well. And that was used with the um, Lee Enfield number five um, jungle carbine. And it actually was a proper bayonet. And uh, this same uh, frog is used for that knife as well, or that bayonet as well. And so that is why you still need the loop up here. Now you're going to find all sorts of frogs uh, uh, that are listed as pattern 37. They're not all going to be like this one. Some of them will have a much thinner um, uh, top band up here of webbing. And it really just works for the, uh, the number four bayonet, this bayonet here. It only will work for that one or work well with that one. Uh, you'll also find that they have um, an extra piece of webbing strap that goes through here and loops around so that it hooks the uh, the number four fr uh, scabbard better into this. But if you have the buttonhole here, you don't really need to worry about that. What's more, this, uh, this same uh, frog uh, continued to be useful for the number nine uh, bayonet which was the replacement bayonet that eventually showed up to replace the uh, number four bayonets. So this frog uh, continued to be made uh, even after World War II, but it, you'll see numerous versions of it. And so when you get this and you go, wait a minute, it doesn't fit the, uh, the scabbard at all. The scabbard is so loose in there, it's like, no, this is actually the proper frog for it, or but it just looks wrong. So, just something else to keep in mind when you find this thing. The, the frog was usable by numerous bayonets, and most of the other bayonets were bladed bayonets, which required a wider scabbard, and because of that, it's really loose and wobbly inside this one. An interesting note is that the, uh, the United States actually made a combination frog and scabbard for the number four bayonet in a similar fashion that they did with their, uh, uh, with their uh, MH sheaths for their bayonets. So it was all one piece and uh, it was nice and tight and uh, held the uh, bayonet much more securely than what these did. Uh, another thing to note, let's take a look at the uh, the scabbard now. If you can see there, and you probably can't, uh, this is stamped uh, number four Mark One. Now I've got a number four Mark Two bayonet. Well, most bayonets ended up with a number four Mark One style scabbard, regardless of the number of it. Um, you will find different throats on here. All right, I have the scabbard back out of the frog again, and there you have it. Number four, or Mark One. I think you can see that pretty clearly. And you got the uh, the stud, which secures it to the frog. And then basically on this side, you see a little screw. And the screw is what holds the uh, throat, which is what is marked into the tube. And the tube was basically just pressed out of steel and you've got the ball down here at the bottom. And I don't know if that was milled out of the same uh, tube or not. Uh, does appear to be, it might have been screwed in, I do not know, and I'm not gonna try and take it apart. Later ones are just stamped out of a single piece of steel. Uh, there's no little ball on the bottom, but the throat is still attached in the same way, and they will be marked uh, either number two or number three. I think there might be four different versions of uh, of uh, scabbards that were made for it. An interesting note though is at the very bottom there you will see a little hole in the bottom of the ball 
and that is so that there's a drain hole here so that water could run out of the sheath or scabbard rather. Uh, the difference from what I have, I have been told, a scabbard is usually made of steel, a sheath is made out of leather or cloth, something like that. Um, I've always heard it that a sheath was uh, when you have the scabbard along with the frog all in one piece, then it's a sheath, uh, but then that doesn't really work too well with like the uh, M8 scabbard because, well, <laughs> it's all attached in one piece. Uh, so it's if it's steel or something hard, it's considered a scabbard. If it's something that's bendable, it's a sheath. And it, it carries over from the days of swords. Okay, enough about that. I said there was something else kind of interesting with these uh, bayonets and uh, so I will talk about that now. First of all, this is also a Mark II Star. Now this one, it does have the arrow where it was entered into service, but there are uh, no other markings on the top except this big X on the top. And I have a feeling what happened was this was removed from service and they tried to grind everything off. Even the arrow looks like uh, they were grinding it off. Uh, so whoever made this one, I have no idea, but it is in really good shape. Uh, but I think the X on the top is the same as the, uh, the second stamping of the, uh, the uh, arrow when they removed it from service. In any case, that one came with this scabbard, so I keep it with this scabbard. Now, the other thing. What other useful thing could you have with a spike like this? Well, the the British uh, found out real quickly that one of the things that you use a bayonet for, and they've been doing it for a long time, was for probing for mines. And they used to have this with 14 inches of length to probe for mines. You know, you get there, and when you probe for a mine, you're not just going through and sticking the ground like that. That's not what you do. You come in at at an angle and you're trying to hit the top of the mine or the side of the mine at an angle and well if you got 14 inches and you're coming at an, a, at an angle of about 30 degrees you're a good distance from the mine especially if the mine is three or four inches buried under the ground you're looking like for anti-tank mines and stuff like that they're not going to just be sitting on top of the ground and so you use these to probe for mines Basically, typically, you're laying on your belly going like this. With that much of a length, you, ha you have a much better option of probing. When you basically have this and you're probing for a mine, you're on top of the mine, very close to it. Uh, now, might be more psychological than anything else, but you also... Do not have, you know, you're coming in at an angle. Well, look at that. If that mine is four inches underground and you're probing like so, you could easily miss the mine simply because you're not probing deep enough. And so that was a problem with this, but they solved that problem. And it wasn't by going for a longer spike. Enter the British entrenching tool from World War II. You got this uh, spade head, and you got this little chisel or pick on one end, and then you got what they call a helve or handle. And you notice the metal part here. You slip it through. This is a very common way of making them. The, the Germans came up with the folding shovel. Uh, I think they might have done that during World War II, but this was a, a very common uh, entrenching tool, especially in the British Army. You take it, you whack it on the ground to seat the head, and you got your entrenching tool. It's still a brutal thing if you need to use it in battle and stuff like that. But by basically putting a bayonet socket on the end here, or bayonet plug on the end here, you now have something that gives you a lot of reach. Let's take off the head first. So now what they have as part of their uh, mine clearing equipment 
is a stick with a bayonet on the end and that is actually longer than their old bayonet so they actually have more reach with this than they did their older bayonet and uh, got nice good distance and you can probe you can actually get a little higher and probe going down like so so kind of holding it like a pull cue or something and you can just sit there and probe the ground you have a lot more reach you can go deeper than you could without the spike on the end of the stick and which is basically what it was and quite frankly also if in a pinch you needed to you do have something a little bit longer uh, to use as a weapon but that's really not what it was designed for um, why put this on the end of this stick when you would uh, have a, a number four rifle so unless you lost your rifle in which case this is better than nothing um, and this continued to be useful even when they switched over to a bladed bayonet so the uh, entrenching tool held with the uh, bayonet plug on the end here kind of a cool little thing that the British came up with uh, in any case, uh, I think that pretty much wraps it up for the uh, number four Mark II Star Bayonet. Probably more information than you ever wanted to know. And you know what? I still really haven't gone into the uh, full history of this one, which is really a much cooler looking bayonet than that spike. And someday I will get around to getting to that one too any case, stick around. I have uh, some slides with a lot of uh, information in there all, as well. So, hope you enjoyed it. Let me take just a second to thank you once again for dropping by 
and spending a few minutes here at Knife Chats with Tobias. I really do appreciate it, and I do appreciate any comments that you leave. So please uh, remember to give me that thumbs up, and also don't forget to subscribe and ring that notification bell so you'll know when the next episode is up and running. Thanks again for dropping by. Really do appreciate your time here.